again, there's no way I can add anything to what Brother Johnson has just preached. Uh, but if I may, when Jesus told Simon Peter that Satan was coming to sift him as wheat, he said, but I've prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. He didn't say that your prayer fail not. Your fasting fell not. Your worship fell not. Do we need all these things? Absolutely. But I've prayed when I didn't feel like praying. And I've worshiped when I didn't feel like worshiping. I've came to church when I didn't feel like going to church. I'd done it because I knew that's what I needed to do. And there was still a little bitty spark of faith. That was left in me. The point being is, as long as you hold on to your faith, the devil will not be able to destroy us. As long as we hold on to our faith, the devil will not be able to destroy us. So every circumstance and situation that we face and go through, ultimately the devil is after our faith. Because if he gets our faith, the sifting is going to finish us off. But if we can keep our faith in the middle of the sifting, God will turn it all around and take what the devil meant for bad and use it for our good. And ultimately, our faith will soar to heights we've never experienced before. I think it'd be appropriate for us to lift our hands and pray a simple prayer. God, we pray for the faith of one another in this building today. Jesus, as you prayed for Simon Peter, that his faith would not fail. We pray for every minister that their faith would not fail them. We pray for every saint that their faith would not fail them. We pray for every man, every woman in this building that their faith would not fail them. I pray that you encourage today. We pray against doubt again today. And we are praying, Lord, in the sifting process that anyone is going through in this building today that they would hold on to their faith. In Jesus' name, let's clap our hands to the Lord one more time. Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God. Anybody feel like you have the victory today? Come on, do you feel like you have the victory today? Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As you make your way back to your seats, look at somebody and say, hey, everything's going to be all right. Come on, tell somebody. Say, get your hopes up. Get your hopes up. Be encouraged today. God's still on the throne. He still knows who you are. He still knows your name. How many appreciate the word of the Lord and the word of faith we just received? Aren't you thankful that God sent his word to heal us? Hallelujah. The man that is coming to preach the word of the Lord to us now <clears throat> started preaching at, at 14 years of age he went full time on the evangelistic field at 17 years of age he evangelized full time for 10 years he has been pastoring in Fort Worth, Texas for somewhere around 12 years and his years of pastoring there they have seen tremendous growth. They have an incredible church. They've remodeled their building um, several times um, within this 12-year period. They are right now making plans to build a new one on a brand new piece of property that they just purchased right off the interstate. He is a man of many talents, a man that intimidates me greatly. He is an awesome preacher, teacher, pastor, musician, singer, a writer of books, a writer of songs. The list goes on and on. And he is a true friend. And he is one of the greatest Christians that you will ever meet in your life. Let's give a good welcome to Brother Steve Pixler as he comes to minister the word of the Lord.
Praise the Lord, everybody. What a blessing it is to be here in this Impact Conference. This year, my first year to be here was last year, but I have been blessed um, through the preaching of this meeting throughout the years, different means, and um, I'm very honored to be here. Brother and Sister Carney, thank you so much for your friendship. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I have um, received so much from the Word of the Lord this week. I have enjoyed everything that I've heard so far. Um, I apologize to Brother Huntley for missing the first service Tuesday night. <clears throat> American Airlines helped me out with that, sent me to Hattiesburg scurrying for a suit. And um, thank God for American Airlines. I have a good spirit toward American Airlines right now. I'm praying a blessing on them, <clears throat> at least till my plane gets back home. But um, so good to, to um, hear Brother Jay Carney and then Brother Williams during the day yesterday and then Brother Bernard in the, um, the minister's luncheon. Um, I really, really, really was affected by just his presentation. I was captured by the vision that he is sharing. And um, I believe God is doing great things. And I'm excited about what he's doing. And um, I, was, I was blessed by that. The word of the Lord last night from Brother Williams. And then today, Brother Johnson preaching the word of the Lord. My faith, my faith is strengthened just from this service today already. I feel a keener, sharper focus just from what I've heard in the, just the last few minutes. Amen. Thank God for it. That reasonable doubt oftentimes is not even necessarily doubting God. It's doubting ourselves. It's doubting that God can do it through us believe God can do anything I just also know the power I have to mess up what he's doing and that messes with my mind and I know we all wrestle with that but God's helping us today to see that our confidence is not in ourselves but it's in God who raises the dead that's what Paul said our confidence is not in ourselves but it's in God who raises the dead and that is the ultimate infallible proof God raises the dead. Thank you, Brother Lance, for your kind introduction. One of my dearest friends in the whole world. We have been friends a long, long time. And we're neither of us very old. <clears throat> Both still just boys. I am anyway. I don't know about you, but I just turned 40 this year and still feel 18. Except for my hairline. <clears throat> my waistline and um, laugh lines. Mm. Soon will be the senior citizens line and whatever else. But anyway, thank you very much, Brother Lance. I love you. Let's look to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, one of those scary passages. One of those passages used to frighten so many well, let's see if we can move around the, the scary parts. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This passage is often used to refer to backsliding, but it's not really talking about backsliding it's talking about defection from the faith in the particular instance of Hebrews who were Hebrew Christians who were turning from Christ back to Judaism 
And so the writer says, if you fall away, and he's using an Old Testament term for defection or to become a traitor, if you commit treason to the gospel and you fall away, as they said of Jeremiah, he has fallen away to the enemy and is siding with the Babylonians. So the writer is saying, if you fall away from the faith and you turn away from Christ back to the Old Testament sacrifices, it's impossible to renew you. You cannot find restoration you're not going to be able to come into the age to come when God will make all things new you will not experience the renewal that God has promised for all of Israel you will not share in what he said through the prophets if you defect from the faith and turn back to animal sacrifices there remaineth therefore no more sacrifice for sins other than Jesus Christ he's the only sacrifice for us and so he's telling us then Let's hold fast to the confidence we have been given that is in Christ. So if you look then at several things he lists in verses 4 and 5, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come. What a list describing our Christian experience. Oh, that, there's enough preaching in just in those two verses to last us a lifetime. I want to pull out two parts of this, two phrases, partakers of the Holy Ghost and the powers of the world to come. Now, I want to preach today. My subject today is the power of the world to come. But I want to look at that balance in, this, in this, these two verses between being made partakers of the Holy Ghost and the powers of the world to come. When we think of being made partakers of the Holy Ghost, we easily think of being enlightened or of tasting the heavenly gift or even tasting the good word of God. But sometimes maybe we don't think enough about how the present experience of the Holy Ghost is an anticipation of the world to come. And that's what I want to talk about today with particular focus before we're done by the grace of God on how signs, miracles, and wonders are the sign of the coming age. In breaking moments where miracles, where God intervenes in history, and in a moment there's a flash of heaven on earth, and something breaks loose in this present realm that is a sign or a signal an anticipation of what it's going to be like. I wonder if God would help us today. Will you help me in the word of the Lord for just a few moments? Can you lift your hands together with me now? Let's call on the Lord together. Great God of heaven, we long for your word. We long for understanding. We long for insight. Oh God, help us get our minds right before you and in alignment with you that the word of God by the Spirit of God would help us see the purpose of God, the mission of the church, what you've called us to do. Anoint me to preach. Anoint us all to hear. Speak your word, O oh God. Let your Spirit rest upon us. In Jesus' name. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Sing it with me. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. There's nothing more beautiful than when the church sings, how great Thou art.
to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you for your kindness in standing and hearing the word of the Lord as we've read today. The age to come. It's a phrase that's used throughout the New Testament several different occasions. Jesus talked about those who blaspheme the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven in this world nor in the world to come which of course is the age to come. Um, other places he talks about in the kingdom when it comes, the restoration when it comes. Um, Paul talks about in Galatians about living in this present evil age. In Ephesians 1 he says that Jesus is Lord not only in this world, uh, but in the world to come or in the age to come. Um, and then, of course, where we read in Hebrews, he talks about the age to come. So there's several places throughout the New Testament where the world to come or the age to come is, is discussed. And this phrase, this idea of the age to come was nothing new to New Testament writers or nothing new or original with them. Jesus was not the first one to speak in these terms, neither was Paul. But rather, this was a concept that had been much discussed among the Jewish writers in the period between Malachi and Matthew, the intertestamental period between Old Testament, New Testament. During that period of time, there was what is often called the 400 silent years because of there not being the voice of a prophet as there had been before. But through that period of time, there was much discussion about what was called the age to come. And the concept of the age to come is simply that the prophets had told that there would be a day when God would make all things new. Going all the way back to Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, the children of Israel had been told from the beginning that sure as the world, there would be a day when they would fall away from the Lord, that they would turn to idols, and because of their sin against God, God would scatter them among the nations. Moses told them that this was going to happen. He said, you're stiff-necked, you're hard-hearted, and you will do this, and God will respond in this way, which is, of course, exactly what happened. He said, I will scatter you throughout the nations, and he said, then when I have turned your heart, and there's another phrase that's often used, when it turns to the Lord, Paul says, the veil will be taken away, and the prophets talk about the turning again of Israel, which is where the, the phrase repentance or the word repentance comes from, to, to turn again, not just to ask God to forgive me for my personal sins, but for the for the people of God to turn from their wicked ways and turn back to the Lord. Moses said, when you turn again, God is going to gather you from all of the nations where he has scattered you throughout heaven, and he's going to bring you back, and he's going to reconstitute you as the people in the land, and he's going to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham, and God is going to reign over his people, and, and Jerusalem will be exalted, and all that is going to happen. The prophets told about all of this. Now Moses told Israel that if you do not keep the Sabbaths, and you will not, he says, I'm telling you now, I know you, was the man a pastor or what? He said, I know you well enough to know you're not going to do what you're supposed to do. You're not going to keep the Sabbaths. And so he said, God is going to get his Sabbaths out of you one way or another. This is where the 70 years of captivity comes. When Nebuchadnezzar comes, 100 years after the Assyrians had carried, carried Samaria away into captivity, Nebuchadnezzar comes and finishes the task, and Judah is carried away into captivity. And God said, I will get my Sabbaths out of you one way or another. 70 years years worth of Sabbaths they were grounded 
uh, my mom and dad, they learned that there was a time in my life when, when whoopings didn't work anymore. Anybody in here ever get a whooping? Now, we didn't have whippings in my house. We had whoopings. You know the difference between a whipping and a whooping? I still know the difference. Sometimes the old wound troubles me when the weather changes. Uh, but they were grounded. Seventy years, God said, I'm going to get my Sabbaths out of you. But Moses also told them that if you do not repent within this period of your diaspora or your dispersion, your scattering throughout the earth, if you do not repent during exile, I'm going to multiply your wanderings seven times again. So this is where we get the 70 weeks. This is why the angel comes to Daniel and says that this exile is not going to end at the end of 70 years as you thought it would, but rather it's going to be multiplied into 490 years. And so you've got 70 years of Sabbaths now being multiplied because the people did not turn their heart to God completely. And so there is this expectation of when is all of this going to come to pass? So by the time we get to John the Baptist, by the time we get to this man in the spirit of Elijah coming out of the wilderness in, in, in these wild robes and um, eating locusts, my, my son Nicholas is five years old. He said, I don't like John the Baptist. I said, Nicholas, why don't you like John the Baptist? He said, because he eats locusts. And I don't like people that eat locusts. So I showed him a locust in the backyard. I said, what do you think about that? He said, Dad, that's gross. I don't think I like John the Baptist. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. So when is it going to happen? When, when is this going to come to pass? When the prophets told us the age to come is coming, when Messiah is going to come, when God's anointed one is going to come, when God is going to make all things new, when is it going to happen? This was their expectation. And for 400 years, they had different writers. They had people... Um, penning different pieces of literature and writings, uh, uh, Jewish apocalyptic literature and all other kinds of stuff. They were writing constantly and talking to one another. And the expectation began to build that the prophecy that Daniel had given was about to be fulfilled. So when John the Baptist bursts on the scene saying, repent or turn again for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the people listened. When he began to baptize this counter-temple movement down at, at the river, John the Baptist, being a priest, the son of a priest, should have been ministering down at the temple, but because of its corruption through the Sadducean administration and their collusion and cooperation with Rome, John the Baptist is saying, that's become the gates of hell. You're not going to get forgiveness there, but you need to come here to the waters of Jordan, and we're starting a brand new movement of repentance for Israel Come and repent of your sin, and God will wash Israel and bring Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. What's John talking about? He's talking about everything the prophets talked about when he said the nations will learn war no more. They're going to turn their, their, their swords into plowshares and, and, and sickness will be taken away and every man's going to live in his own house. He's going to have his own vineyard and every man's going to dwell under his own vine and, and, and the, the earth is going to burst forth with plenty and the curse is going to be broken and, and, and sin is going to be taken away and, and the, the shroud of death that, that lays over the nations is going to be pulled away like a blanket and God's going to make all things new. Isaiah said, Behold, I curse create a new heavens and a new earth this age to come that they talked about is going to be so powerful and it's going to be so different that it's going to the only way to describe it is like a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness this age to come can you imagine Israel's longing for the age to come the desire that they must have had as they heard John the Baptist preaching there had been many others who had come preaching the time is at hand there had even been some who had lifted themselves up as false messiahs and there would be others who would come along and say we are the ones we're going to usher in the age to come and the expectation of Israel was so strong so powerful and so great that they would some of them follow these zealots these revolutionaries they would 
strap on their sword and put on their armor and they would try to overthrow a Roman garrison or they would try to resist the local Roman tax collectors. They would try to do anything they could to usher in the new age. If somehow we can just somehow create the catalyst for change, then Messiah will come. And when Messiah comes, then he's going to make all things new. And when he comes, he's going to throw off the yoke of Roman oppression. And we're going to liberate Jerusalem from those corrupt Sadducees who are offering sacrifices every day in the name of Caesar. How dare they offer sacrifices in our holy temple in the name of Caesar every day. Someone's got to rise up. We've got to cleanse the temple. We've got to purge the land. We've got to feed the poor. We've got to make religion new. This is the temptation in the wilderness. Turn the stones into bread. You can feed the people. Anybody will follow you. You imagine what you could do with an army if you can feed them with stones. Leap from the temple. Let's cleanse it. Let's purge the Sadducees out. Let's restore Jewish religion as it was intended to be since the time of David and Solomon. The kingdoms of the world, just bow down and I'll give you all the kingdoms. Economy, religion, politics. What was the temptation in the wilderness? For Jesus to buy into an old mindset about how to bring in the kingdom. Bring in the kingdom through a short-circuited way. Jesus said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to fall for that old trick, that old way of trying to bring the kingdom in through economic might, through religious might, through political might. I'm not going to try to bring the kingdom in through the flesh. But the only way the kingdom is going to come is it's going to have to come through the surrender of the cross. And so they're expecting Messiah to come. They're expecting Messiah to rise up. This is what they described as the age to come. They were looking for the age to come when Messiah would make all things new. Messiah, Christ, when he would come, the anointed one of God, the son of David, who would be seated upon the throne of David. When they thought about the coming of Yahweh to his house, the coming of the Lord, they weren't thinking like we think about the second coming because they didn't expect that Messiah was going to come from heaven necessarily. They thought he was going to rise up from among them they thought he was going to come up from the earth they expected him to be a military leader they expected him to be a religious leader they expected him to be a political leader they expected him to be an economic leader they expected him to be a leader on many different levels but the one thing they couldn't imagine is that he would be God himself incarnate they simply couldn't understand the way the world to come was coming This is where they got messed up. And so when John the Baptist came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they, when he cried out, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world, they had no concept that Messiah was coming to be offered as a sacrifice. Surely they had read in Isaiah about the suffering servant, and surely they had read about he was afflicted, he was bruised, he was wounded. Sure they had read about all of that, but I am certain that they interpreted all of that in terms of, of battle, in terms of conflict, in terms of glory rushing forward, banners unfurled, bugles blaring, horses rushing and battle defeating the Romans they saw it all in terms of conquest they saw it all in terms of revolution and this is why Jesus said from the time of the prophets until the time of John the Baptist he said now men are pressing their way into the kingdom through violence they're trying to take the kingdom through violent revolution they're trying to overthrow some way the powers that be to somehow install the powers of the world to come and Jesus said they don't understand if you live by the sword you're going to die by the sword. If you want the kingdom to come, the meek. Excuse me? The who? The meek shall inherit. I don't think so. Slap me on one side of the face, see what I do. Talk to me now. I mean, don't really do it. It's just rhetorical. I'm just saying. In every one of us, there's that impulse to rise. And it's that impulse to rise up, to make things happen in our own power that has to be overcome by the power of the cross. This is the mystery of the cross. This is the victory of the cross that Satan is defeated by seemingly winning. That it is by yielding that we overcome. It is by being conquered that we conquer. It is by suffering violence that we break the power of violence. 
It is by being done wrong that we set things right. Woo, we don't even want to hear that. Ain't nobody shouting. Me either. I don't like that stuff any more than you do. That's the stuff that's working on our spirit. And yet the age to come was the expectation of the day when God would make all things right through the coming Christ, through Messiah, when God would set everything in order. They were expecting the age to come to come. The problem is they didn't know how the age to come was coming. And so when Jesus came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the rule of heaven, the rule of the heavens upon the earth. When Jesus came preaching, repent for the rule of heaven is at hand what they were talking about is what Nebuchadnezzar described when he said the heavens they do rule Nebuchadnezzar found out that our God is still upon the throne the problem is is that from the very beginning of creation God separated the heavenly and the earthly and he put the veil of the firmament between the two and he divided up what Paul calls the first and second heaven the heaven you see at day and the heaven you see in the night and then the heaven you cannot see because it is invisible to us God divided it by a firmament and he throw, enthroned himself beyond that veil in that invisible realm called the heavenlies but in the heavenlies God rules in the heavenlies God is in charge in the heavenlies God is in control this is the kingdom of the heavens and when Jesus comes preaching repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand when Jesus came preaching uh, uh, repent for the rule of heaven is coming the people of God said oh yeah this is what we've been waiting for this is what we've been looking for but they missed how it would happen and so the Bible says that because they thought the kingdom would immediately appear Jesus told them a parable about a man who went on a long journey because he wanted them to understand there is a process by which the kingdom of God is coming, by which the age to come is coming. And I mean by that the age that for us is on the other side of the second coming. When Jesus comes again and we are resurrected, when the rapture occurs and, and they that are dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm talking about when the trumpet sounds I'm talking about when this mortal puts on immortality and this corruptible puts on incorruption and then is brought to pass the saying from Isaiah 25 death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is your sting oh grave where is your victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to God somebody help me now I'm telling you there is still an age to come there is still a world coming, brother, where God is going to make everything right. Where injustice will be broken. Where no longer the poor will go hungry. Where there will be no more homeless needing someone to help them find a place to shelter their family. Where there will be no more war. There will be no more nuclear warheads, as President Bush likes to say. There will be no more fussing over debt limits and no more trying to settle what to do with Iran and there'll be no more problem in the Middle East with Palestinians and Israelis trying to figure out who owns what there'll be no more fighting over Jerusalem for Jerusalem from which is Jerusalem from above will settle down I'm talking about an age to come where there's not gonna be any more crick in my back when I get up in the morning where well, there's not going to be any more diagnoses from a doctor sir I'm sorry to tell you you've got cancer there's not going to be any more standing by the casket of a loved one with tears dripping anybody looking for the age to come <laughs> hallelujah I'm talking about when Jesus rules upon the earth I'm talking about when the power of sin is broken Blind eyes are open, deaf ears are unstopped, and the cripple walks again. I'm talking about where there's no more aged and decrepit, as my dad likes to say. I'm just old and decrepit. I used to wonder what in the world was decrepit. I'm finding out. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> Their problem was 
not only that they had some distorted concepts about the age to come, that, that, all of that could be corrected and sorted out, but the, the fundamental flaw, the basic flaw that could not be overcome was that they didn't understand how the age to come was coming. Jesus said, when talking about the kingdom, he said, your concept concerning the kingdom is all mixed up. You think the kingdom is coming through violence. You think the kingdom is coming through revolution. You think the kingdom is coming with, with armies marching in grand parades down the thoroughfare. You, you think the kingdom is coming by the strength of military might. You think that you can do this. You think you can meet the Romans and fight fire with fire, but not understanding that if you fight fire with fire, you're going to get burned. If you start fighting Romans like Romans, you're going to become like Romans. And, he, and Jesus says, I'm introducing something into the world that is so profoundly different from anything you've ever understood about how the kingdom comes. Now, I'm persuaded, and, and the reason I'm even preaching this today is because in my own prayer, in my own study, in my own pastoring, in my own walk with God, I am persuaded that we still struggle with the same fundamental problem of, of not understanding fully how the kingdom comes, how the world to come is coming. Jesus said, you think it's going to immediately appear, so let me tell you the truth. It's going uh, to come gradually. They thought it was going to happen soon, and they thought it was going to happen suddenly. They thought that Messiah was going to appear and all at once create the end of history, bring is history to its end, and then he was going to raise up the dead, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Daniel chapter 12 is one of the strongest intimations in the Old Testament of a resurrection when the angel says to Daniel, you will stand in your lot. You will rise with your fathers and you will stand in your lot at the end of days. Your, your lot, your inheritance, your place in the land. It's going to come a day, Daniel, when after you have been long dead, God's going to raise you back up. They were expecting a resurrection. They were expecting God to make things new. Certainly some of them didn't believe in the resurrection, but most of them did. They believed God was going to raise Israel up, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were going to live with them, and David would live again, and that Messiah, the son of David, would rule forever, and they were going to come into the kingdom, and all the good things that were going to happen. Jesus said, your problem is you don't understand how it's going to happen. It's not going Going to happen immediately but it's going to come into the world in a way you have not yet understood it's going to come into the world through your brokenness it's going to come into the world through your suffering it's going to come into the world through your exile it's going to come into the world this way and they couldn't get it and this is why they rejected Jesus and ultimately this is why he was crucified as a false Messiah to them because they didn't understand that in nailing him to the cross they were actually fulfilling everything Jesus said must happen in order for the world to come to come what they didn't get is what Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 13 when he lays out seven parables of the kingdom. Of course, Matthew arranges these parables in other gospels. They're told, told in different times and at different places. But Matthew pulls them together and puts them in one sermon, if you will. And he says, here are seven things that Jesus said about the kingdom. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like mustard seed in the ground. It's so small you can barely even see it. It's tiny. It's nothing. It's like 11 men standing on top of a mountain watching Jesus disappear into the sky 11 nobodies 11 losers 11 men who had fled into the night and defected from Jesus and left him to die alone 11 uneducated men 11 men that couldn't get alone down at the bank 11 men who don't have any money they don't have any political clout they don't have any connections down at city hall 11 and Jesus said, it's through you 11 losers that I'm going to turn the world upside down. It's through you 11 nobodies that I'm going to prove that the treasure is going to be in an earthen vessel, a cracked clay pot, so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of man. I'm going to demonstrate that our confidence does not lie in the flesh. Israel, you've missed it all along. You thought you were going to inherit the promises because you were Abraham's seed. But Jesus said, God can raise up children unto Abraham from these rocks. You can't trust in your circumcision and you can't trust in your Sabbath keeping and you can't trust in your feast days and you can't trust in your sacrifices. It's not in what you can do through your own works that is going to bring in the kingdom, but it's going to be a life-changing, transforming experience when the Holy Ghost comes and makes you new. 
So Jesus said it's going to be like a mustard seed in the ground, and it's going to grow up out of the ground, and it's going to become like a, 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 a mighty tree that is so large that even the fowls of the air can come and build their nests in it. Jesus said, I want you to understand there is a process by which the world to come is coming. There is a process by which the world to come is coming. There is a process by which the second coming is coming. Go, tarry in Jerusalem. Put up your sword, he said. Sword's not going to do it. He asked him, how many swords do you have? They said, we have two swords. He said, it's enough. Most scholars think he was being sarcastic. It's enough, it's enough, it's enough. Because they weren't getting it. Jesus wasn't asking them to arm themselves. Two swords. If I'm going up against a garrison of soldiers, I'd like to have more than two steak knives, people. Somebody help me out with something here. I want some, some, some heavy artillery. When Jesus said it is enough, he's saying, you're not getting it. <laughs> Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with what? Power from, from where? From the world to come. From that realm where God's rule is total. From that realm where there is no sin and there is no lying and there is no sickness. From that realm where God's in charge. Till you be endued with power from another world that locks you in sync with another way of thinking, with another way of walking, that begins to fill you up until you blow up with the atmosphere of another world, until you begin to be filled up with the spirit that animates you with a way of thinking that doesn't come out of military manuals and doesn't come out of self-help books till you be oh no no I'm all for leadership I'm all for self I'm all for all that kind of stuff but brothers that's not gonna bring the kingdom it's not gonna bring the kingdom all of my leadership books in my library are not gonna bring the kingdom they're just two swords it's enough it's enough that's just two swords but, but what's gonna bring the kingdom it's gonna be when I can get in alignment when I can get in alignment when I can get in alignment with the rule of heaven, when I can get in alignment with the reign of God from another realm, and I begin to embody, and I begin to incarnationally manifest the rule of heaven in the earth, and I begin to realize in my daily life the reign of God in everyday life, and earth around me begins to be transformed as the power of heaven begins to flow out my fingertips, and the power of heaven begins to flow out of my mouth, and the power the power of heaven begins to take charge of my eyes and my ears and my hands and my feet. And the power of heaven begins to take charge of my conversation because my citizenship is in heaven and I'm looking for something to come a better country that is a heavenly. I'm looking for something to do what? To come down from God out of heaven. Brothers and sisters, what I'm preaching is that the process by which the world to come is coming is a gradual process through which God breaks into the hearts of individuals the power of a heavenly realm that begins to explode out of you and me into this earthly and we begin to transform the world around us because the world around us begins to come into sync with the world to come. Tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and what? Uttermost parts of the earth. A quote from Psalm 2. Ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Do you understand what Jesus was saying? He was saying that the fulfillment of the age of Messiah in Psalm 2 when God says to Messiah, I will give you the heathen for thy possession. The uttermost parts of the earth for your inheritance. I will give it to you. And Jesus said, here is how I'm going to realize my inheritance. Here is how I as the son of David that has been given all things all authority in heaven and in earth belongs to me but here is how I'm going to realize it make it real here is how I'm going to actualize it make it actual here is how I'm going to actually bring it to pass in the world all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me God has given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow what 
of things in heaven, of things in earth, and of things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father all things have been put under his feet but we see not yet Hebrews 2 all things put under him but what do we see but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor he is already in the heavens crowned and ruling and yet the rule of Christ in heaven must be realized in you and me and through you and me in our households in our churches, in our communities, and throughout the world, everywhere we go preaching the gospel. This is how the kingdom comes. This is how the world to come is coming. This is how the second coming is coming. And this is why Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that we should live this way as Christians in the world because by so doing, we are hasting the coming. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. You're going to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria. And, the, uh, and when the gospel has been published in every nation, what? Then, then, I'm trying to tell you that there is a cooperative effort. There is a synergistic cooperation, synergism, energy, or the ergos, working. Sin means together or with. Synergy is working with or working together. There is a synergy, an incarnational synergy by which word is made flesh in us as believers. And through this process of God working with them, confirming the word with signs, signs of what signs of the coming age signs of the coming age God working what with them confirming the word I'm trying to tell you that the only way God can bring about as he has designed it the only way God can bring about the fulfillment of his purpose in the world is in cooperation with believers this is why Jesus Christ came this is why the incarnation happened in the first place because Israel was not getting it they were not understanding it they were not seeing that it could not be done by unregenerate flesh but Jesus Christ said I am coming as almighty God wrapped up, not just wrapped up, but embodying human existence. Not just God putting on the shell of a body, but God literally incarnating himself within a full, total, complete human, Jesus Christ, the second man. Adam and Jesus said I'm coming from above down into the world because the only way God's kingdom is going to be realized in the world is for God himself I looked for someone to bring my salvation he said and I couldn't find anybody to do it for me so he said I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to extend my arm and he said my own arm is going to bring me salvation and almighty God himself plunged into the very depths of human existence and human experience so that almighty God himself could take hold of everything that had gone wrong with humanity and make it right and so he took hold of our humanity though he was sinless because he was not born under the covenantal curse of Adam but though he was sinless yet he was everything we are though he was sinless he was fully man though he was sinless he was fully flesh though he was sinless he was everything you and I so that he could be touched Oh, hallelujah. He did not take upon him the seed of angels, but rather he took upon him the seed of Abraham. He took upon him the nature of human being so that by taking on to himself everything that we are, he could be touched with the feelings of our infirmities so he could be tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. Why? To prove that you can live victorious over sin. To give you and me the power to live in this flesh victorious over the power of sin. And so Almighty God, from above, from the world to come, descended down into the earth and he took upon him the earthly. He took upon him humanity and he wrapped himself in it. But he didn't stop when he descended to a stable. He didn't stop when he was nailed to a cross. He didn't even stop when they laid him in a borrowed tomb. But Jesus Christ kept descending, condescending to men of low estate until he plunged.
plunged all the way to the deepest depths of human depravity until he went to the very bowels of hell itself to where the lowest human soul had ever fallen and almighty God said I'm not going to leave you where you are but I'm going to descend to the deepest depths that you have fallen and I am going to grab you from as low as you can go and I am going to lay hold to humanity and I'm going to raise you up again Oh, hallelujah. I'm preaching to you that when Jesus came kicking his way through the gates of hell and he began to rise from the lowest hell back up to the earthly and from the earthly he ascended all the way back up into heaven that as Ephesians said he might ascend above all things that he might fulfill all things. That all things can be used in the Greek as the universe. Ta panta. All things. Jesus said, I'm going to rule over all of it. All of it. And Paul said, the reason why Jesus did this is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together all things in one, everything in Christ, everything which is in heaven and everything which is in earth. Paul said, the purpose of... Oh, God, help me preach. The purpose of God from the beginning has been to somehow bring heaven and earth into perfect alignment. When God first created the world, he divided heaven and earth and he hid heaven behind the veil. But he said there's coming a day when the veil... is going to open and when that veil opens heaven's going to become transparent to earth and where once earth rocked and reeled and careened out of orbit stumbling like a drunk man on its axis out of sync and out of alignment with heaven because of Adam's sin Jesus Christ said I'm going to be like the captain of the ship that steps on board the boat and says I'm bringing this vessel back on course And so Paul said that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might unite or properly align our Father, say it with me, which art in heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. How? I got to get it lined up. Because if I can get heaven lined up with earth, my marriage is going to be right. Husbands, love your wives like Jesus loves the church. Because if I can get heaven lined up with earth, my relationship with my children is going to be right. Fathers, love your kids like Jesus loves his sons and daughters. Help me preach somebody I'm trying to tell you. When you get heaven lined up, Sunday night breaks loose. When you get heaven lined up, evangelism works. Ask Cornelius. When you get heaven lined up with earth... All of a sudden, prayer breaks through. Yeah, travail kicks in. And when we don't know how to pray like we ought to pray, the Holy Ghost from another world begins to make intercession for us according to the will of God with groanings that are too deep for words. And the Holy Ghost begins to intercede and we begin to be brought into alignment with heaven. And we, through the Holy Ghost, become conduits of heaven to earth. power of the world to come. The problem was they didn't understand how the world to come was coming. Brothers and sisters, before God, my prayer today is that somehow God would open my eyes, that the eyes of my understanding would be enlightened, that he would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of my understanding be enlightened, that I might know. What is the hope of the calling? The hope of the calling always has to do with the resurrection in the New Testament, always. That I might understand the hope of the calling. That I might know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Of his inheritance in the saints. What has Christ inherited? All things. Do a quick study through the writings of Paul on all things. All things. It's everywhere. 
in Paul's writing. It informs his, his view of the victory of Christ is total and complete. This is why we cannot surrender the doctrine of hell. This is why we must preach that God will remedy the problem of sin and that he will defeat it and that he will in righteous judgment judge the wicked. This is why we cannot lose it because even hell itself in the book of Revelation stands as a testimony to God's righteous judgment. And in the book of Isaiah, the last chapter, the kings of the earth come by and they marvel at God's judgment over the enemies and over particularly the enemy, Satan himself, as the kings of the earth rejoice and say, look how lowly you are from Isaiah 14 and from Ezekiel. 28 and you see how God triumphs over his enemies even hell itself is the celebration of God's righteous judgment over sin now that kind of knocks the wind out of my message I think because we don't like to think about the horrors of hell and yet if we can't see God's righteous judgment in its totality in its fullness we will never understand how God can make all things new and can redeem his creation. So then, huh, how is it coming? This inheritance that belongs to Christ, how is it coming? Well, it's coming because the earnest of that inheritance is already at work within us. In other words, the coming is bringing its own coming. If I can say it this way, the coming that is coming has already come. And having already come, it is bringing the coming that has already come to the coming that is still coming. This is why Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth, I press toward the mark the finish line, for the prize, resurrection, of the high calling. Now, the high calling is not just lofty vocation. It means the upward call. It means literally that there is a calling from on high, like a runner. This is the image he's using of a marathon runner who's in the last stage of the race, and he's running through the valley, and now he's coming up the hill toward the city that sits on top of the mountain. And as he's running, dum, 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 dum. Go learn what that means. And as he's running up, and I don't know from personal experience. I just thought I'd put that in there in case somebody knows what I'm talking about. And so running up the mountain, running up the mountain, there is an upward call. There's something pulling me, Paul said. I'm putting behind me the gravitational pull of earth because there is a pull from heaven that has got hold of me. He said, I don't think that I've yet laid hold on it. He said, but I am trying to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold on me. Oh, talk to me now. I'm talking about something that grabbed hold of you when God filled you with the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said, I am going to bring the world to come. I am going to bring in the fullness of the end of the age and the kingdom when Christ rules upon the earth and the new heaven and the new earth when all things are done and the last judgment is complete and God has wrapped up all that he is going to do. He said, I'm bringing it all to pass because I am taking the power of the world to come and I am implanting it in you right now. This is the thing that surprised Israel about the resurrection of Jesus. They, many of them, most of them believed in the resurrection. It wasn't a problem of believing in resurrection for the average Jew in Jesus' day. It was the Sadducean elite that didn't believe the intellectuals, the academics. They were the ones who questioned the resurrection. Your average Jew on the street believed in the resurrection. What he could not fathom is that God would do it in one man in the middle of history. That's what they couldn't get. 
They thought it had to happen at the end of history when all things are made new and the end of the old age occurs and then the new age begins. But God said, I'm going to create an overlap of ages. Paul said, we're still continuing in this present evil age. And he said, and yet the age to come is already being experienced in us now. The resurrection is still future. He said, I'm preaching hard, calling them by name on conference floors against those who are preaching that the resurrection is past all already. He said, don't let anybody deceive you, not for a moment, to make you think that the resurrection is already done. Because there's coming a day when the trumpet's going to sound, when God is going to gather his people. Don't let anybody tell you that the resurrection is past because there's still coming a day, Romans chapter 8, when all creation is going to be made new. As long as there's still curse on the earth, the resurrection isn't here yet. As long as there's still sickness and cancer, as long as there's still leukemia, as long as there's still diabetes, as long as we're still fighting with all that stuff, that means the curse is still here. And as long as the curse is still here, the resurrection hadn't come yet. Because Romans chapter 8 said when the resurrection comes, all creation is going to share in the glorious liberty. Going to be liberated from bondage to share in the glorious liberty of the sons of God. I'm preaching to you that all creation is waiting, Paul said, with eager expectation. It literally means standing up on tiptoes and looking around the corner and saying, when is the parade of the sons of God going to get here? When you walk by trees, salute. Excuse me. When you walk by mountains, look at you with eager anticipation. When you set fishing in the stream, trying to get that trout to come by, or trying to get that bass to come by. When you're out on the boat, you have no idea. The lake is humming underneath you. The, the lake senses something inside you. You don't understand when you just walk across the ground, the earth is trembling beneath your feet because embodied within you is the power that will one day set this creation free. No wonder Paul said, I wish you could see it. I wish you could see it. I wish you could see the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints. Because Jesus said, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to plant myself like a grain of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. It's going to be like a mustard seed that's small at first. Everybody's going to laugh. And and Caesar's not even going to realize on his island paradise while a man is crying out, Eli, Eli, la sabach than I, which being interpreted means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and Caesar don't even know while he's lying back on his chase lounge with some scantily clad female dropping grapes in his open mouth. Somebody's fanning him, got a little umbrella over him to shade him from the Mediterranean sun. Oh, Caesar's laying back thinking he's king of the world. He has no idea when Jesus says it is finished that Caesar's rule was done. Oh yeah, for the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his, but I don't see it. We see not yet all things put, but it's under him. It's under, how are you going to see it? You can't see it at Walmart. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen the kingdom of God at Walmart. Even the people in the kingdom don't usually look like the kingdom at Walmart. Got their house robe and their slippers and their hair in curlers. That don't look like the kingdom of God to me. I'm from First Pentecostal Church. Please don't tell them that. If you're going to look like that at Walmart, tell them you're from First Baptist. Sorry, Baptist. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> oh, no wonder he said, I want him to see it. I want him to see it. Because it is in seeing it that we begin to live it. And it is in living it that the vine begins to grow. And the seed that has fallen in the ground begins to grow up out of the ground. And as it begins to grow up out of the ground, it begins, as Paul says in Colossians 1, it begins to bear fruit throughout all the earth. He said so that the gospel is being preached in all creation. Everywhere it's beginning to bear fruit throughout the whole world. So Jesus said it's going to be like Leaven in three measures of meal. He's not talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. He's not talking about that the kingdom is like false doctrine. 
No, no. He's saying that the kingdom of heaven will be like leaven. Some people say, well, leaven's always a type of sin. Not always. In the thank offering, in the tabernacle, you would bring leaven. It, it, it's a sign of permeation. It's a sign of what are you permeating. In the thank offering, you're permeating the offering with thanksgiving. When it represents sin, it's permeating sin. But it just simply means the permeative effect of anything that influences other things. That's what leaven represents. So when Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven in three measures of meal, he is saying that the kingdom of heaven is going to permeate everything it gets in. It's going to touch everything it gets in. Everywhere it goes, it's going to affect the world. Now, I've got to be careful here to say this, that I'm not talking about dominion theology, where we Christianize the whole world, rule the world, take over all the governments of the world, and the church fully embodies the kingdom of God prior to the second coming, and then when we have ruled the world, a post-millennial vision of a thousand years of peace, and then Jesus is going to come back, and it's all going to be wrapped up. That's not what I'm teaching or preaching. What I am saying is that as long as we're on this side of the second coming, we're still living in exile, and as long as we're still living in exile, the curse remains, and as long as the curse remains, the kingdom hasn't fully come. But what I am saying is that though the inheritance does not come in its fullness until Jesus comes again, the earnest of that inheritance has already begun to work in us. And this is why he's changing me. He's sanctifying me. He's making me holy. I know I'm not going to be fully, totally, completely, 100% holy until I get my glorified body. But don't think I'm going to wait till I get there to start letting holiness work in me already. And I know that we're not going to rule the world in its fullness until Jesus comes again. But don't for a minute think that I'm going to make me, let that make me wait about having some dominion in the kingdom of God right now. I'm talking about authority in my work. I'm talking about authority in my, in my studies. I'm talking about dominion in my finances. I'm talking about dominion in my family. I'm talking about dominion in my marriage. I'm talking about dominion with my children. I'm talking about dominion most of all over my own spirit. I'm talking about dominion over my tongue. I'm talking about dominion over my eyes. I'm talking about dominion over my ears. Talk to me now. I'm talking about dominion over my thought life. I'm telling you that the power of the world to come has already broken into my life. And that's why my marriage can look now like the marriage of Christ in the church then. That's why my children can fear the Lord now like the sons of God will fear him then. He didn't leave me alone. He didn't leave me as an orphan. He didn't leave me by myself. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. He said, but I'm going to come and dwell with you. you. Do I have a moment to preach? Do I have a moment to preach? I'm almost done. Almost done. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. He said, but I'm coming. And when I come, he said, I'm now with you, but I shall be. Because the only way the kingdom of God can come is for the kingdom of God to get inside you. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy. What? In the Holy Ghost. And so Jesus said, not only am I going to come down into the world and take on your humanity. Not only am I going to come down into the world and embody myself in your human experience. But I also am going to ascend back up into heaven. And I'm going to take glorified humanity back into the rule of the heavens. And I'm going to put a man on the throne. I'm going to put humanity glorified in charge of the universe and Jesus said this is going to be me opening the veil for you this is going to be me clearing the way at the head of the parade as I walk into heaven and say this has been God's purpose from the beginning that man should be created with glory and honor that he should be crowned and set over all of the works of God's hands Jesus said, but here's how it's going to happen. It's going to be like leaven in the meal that's going to affect the realm of heaven, the realm of earth, and the realm of the deep. All three measures of meal. He said, the kingdom of God will rule over all things, but here is how it will happen. When I ascend into heaven, Jesus said, something is going to transpire. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforter cannot come. 
Jesus is saying, as long as I'm in the world, I am the very center of God's indwelling presence within the world. As long as I'm within the world, there cannot be an omnipresence to break through of the Spirit of God dwelling within your heart. I am the fullness of God bodily. But when Jesus ascended into heaven, if I can say it this way, his glorified humanity infused and filled with the Spirit of Almighty God became omnipresenced and the very Spirit of the man Christ Jesus Jesus became an omnipresent new humanity that began to flow out through the Holy Ghost into the spirits of men and women. What I needed was a new human nature. What I needed was a new human way of thinking, a new human way of talking. What I needed was God to make me a new man, a new human. And so Jesus said, when I send you the Holy Ghost, it's not just going to be the spirit of Almighty God dwelling within you, but it will be the spirit of the one true God flowing going out, out through the human spirit of Christ and through the human spirit of Christ infusing your human spirit with a new way of being human. Did you get that? Isaiah had the Spirit of God working with him. Jeremiah had the Spirit of God working with him. Daniel had the Spirit of God. The Spirit of Christ was in the prophets speaking things. But there was something different about the glorified Spirit of Christ's humanity. Something different than just the Spirit of God that had been at work with the Old Testament prophets. There was something now indwelling us that had not indwelled the prophets. It's that Spirit of glorified humanity. It's the new way of being a man and a woman. It's the new way of being humans in the world. Because Jesus said, when I ascend into heaven and I pour out my Spirit, I'm going to flow back into you and you are going to become conduits and vessels through through which I will perform my ministry in the world. Jesus said, if you think I could heal a multitude with the touch of my hand, wait till I multiply myself in a multitude. If, if, you, if you thought I could heal the blind with just spitting on the ground and making some clay eyeball, if you thought I could do a lot, ah, talk to me now, greater greater somebody say greater God open our eyes somebody say greater God open our eyes somebody say greater these things you've seen me do what did Jesus say greater things than these shall ye do why 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 because I go to the father I'm trying to tell you that God could not bring heaven and earth into perfect alignment until God came down from heaven and took hold of earth and brought earth back into heaven, filled it with the glorified spirit of Christ and then poured it back out into the earth through you and me so that the world could be brought back into magnetic alignment with Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the doctrine of the ascension. I'm talking about understanding what... Oh, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God, my God. If we can see it in the Holy Ghost, if we can see what God is showing us, that Jesus is not just sitting on the throne, twiddling his thumb, just waiting for the calendar to turn until finally the appointed day comes. And he says, oh, huh, good morning, angels. It's time for the second coming. Hey, hey, Gabriel, get your horn. I believe it's time. We've been up here 2,000 years now. He's not just setting up in heaven, twiddling his thumb. He's in heaven mediating. Mediating the coming age into this present age. What they didn't see coming was that God was going to break the coming world into the middle of history and implant it within the world to grow it throughout the world until the pressure of the growing kingdom would so back the powers and principalities into the corner that the very growth of the kingdom itself would become the catalyst for the second coming and the resurrection couldn't help but occur because all creation is so suffused and infused with the redemption of the people of God throughout the world and Satan is so furious like a cornered rat he's fighting with everything he can to stop it and yet it is unstoppable let me see if I can wrap this up 
God of heaven, I ask you to open our eyes. What is Jesus doing right now? What's he doing right now? He's ruling and reigning from heaven right now. But we don't see it manifest in the earth until we let it come out our fingertips. Until we let it come out of us into our world. And we begin to bring the rule of God into the earth.